In half the situations, we know velocity and acceleration as functions of time. And in the other half of situations, we know velocity and acceleration as functions of position. We treat the two cases, a of t and a of x, differently. When acceleration is a function of time, a of t, we write the acceleration as the derivative, a equals dv dt, but dt is really the algebraic quantity, delta t, equals final minus initial, t minus t0, which is just supposed to be a tiny difference. So we can move dt across the equal sign. We have a dt equals dv. If we integrate the left side from t0 to t and the right side from v0 to v, then we get this integral a of t equals the integral dv. The integral dv we can do once and for all as v minus v naught. Or we rearrange this to say the final velocity is the initial velocity plus the integration of a of t across the time interval, where the initial velocity v at t equals zero is v sub zero. We nearly always choose to start the clock at t zero equals zero. When the acceleration of a particle is constant, then it comes out of the integral and we have v equals v zero plus a times the integral of dt, which gives v zero plus a t, which is valid only when the acceleration a is constant. To obtain the position x of t, we integrate again using v equals v0 plus at equals dx dt or the integral over dx from x0 to x equals the integral of v0 plus at from 0 to t. Integration gives x minus x0 equals v0t plus 1 half at squared which is valid only when the acceleration is constant. Suppose that the acceleration of a particle varies in time as a of t equals 3.2 t to the 4.4 measured in meters per second squared. We're also given the initial time t0 equals 0, the final time t equals 1.7 seconds, and the initial velocity is v0 equals minus 0 0.35 meters per second. What will be the final velocity of the object? We integrate a of t across the time interval, which gives the number 10.4, so we get a final velocity of 10 meters per second. When acceleration is a function of position a of x, we have a equals dv dt. If we insert a dx over dx, then we can write this as dv dx dx dt but the dx dt, that's another velocity. So we have acceleration a equals v dv dx, or we write that as a dx equals v dv. We integrate the left side from an initial to a final position, and we integrate the right side from an initial to a final velocity. This integral always gives one half final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared. When the acceleration is constant, then it comes out of the integral, and we have a times the integral over dx from x0 to x equals the previous right-hand side, one-half v squared minus v0 squared, or after integrating, a times x minus x0 equals one-half v squared minus v0 squared, or v squared equals v0 squared plus 2ax minus x0. This equation is valid only when the acceleration is constant. Suppose that the acceleration of a particle varies with location as a of x equals 3x to the fourth, measured in meters per second squared. We're also given an initial location, x0 equals 0. What will be the final velocity of the object? The integration of 3x to the fourth dx gives 3x to the fifth over 5 is equal to the right-hand side, 1 half v squared minus v0 squared. 
So we get the velocity as a function of x is the square root of 6x to the fifth over 5 plus v0 squared. We want to remember, in half the situations, we write acceleration as dv dt, and in the other half, we use a equals v dv dx. In everyday practice, scientists and engineers are able to find antiderivatives for only one in one million situations. So integration is typically done numerically. For example, if the acceleration has a function of time, a of t equals 4.2 t to the 3.3 cosine of 1.3 t cubed plus 0 0.23. If we have t naught equals 0, t equals 4.4 seconds, and the initial velocity v0 equals 1.23 meters per second, then the integration is done numerically, and we find that the velocity at 4.4 seconds will be minus 5.73 meters per second. The simplest and least accurate numerical integration technique is the Riemann sum. The area of one rectangle is height f of t times width delta t, and the total area a under the curve is the sum of the areas of all rectangles a equals sum of f of t times delta t. The total area will change a little if the size of the interval delta t is changed, so we want to find a sufficiently tiny interval such that the summed area becomes independent of the size of delta t. We might start with delta t equal 0.08, calculate the summed area, cut delta t in half to 0.04, and again sum the area and then repeatedly half delta t to 0 0.02, 0 0.01, and so on, and summing until the calculated area stops changing. We then conclude that we have a valid integration. In integral calculus, integration is found by breaking the region into an infinite number of little rectangles of infinitesimal width, which means taking the limit as delta t goes to zero. In practice, it often works well enough to have only 20 rectangles. In physics, it is often found that the number 20 is within 95% of infinity. Often 8 is within 90% of infinity. And this is the reason that the infinity symbol is a sideways 8. We often have 8 approximately equal to infinity. John Kennedy, JK. More complicated numerical routines might vary the step size delta t as the function f of t varies slowly or quickly. Gaussian quadrature is another more accurate technique. Other times the integrand is first expanded in a series of orthogonal polynomials. There are many other techniques. Throughout your career, you will use a numerical package to perform numerical integrations. The package designers use criteria to choose between algorithms. Scientists and engineers just use the result. You can have an entire career improving numerical routines.